Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Doc Hicks Podcast. Unfortunately, with all the murders that have recently happened in the hip-hop community within the past few months, even just in 2020, there has been a negative tone and vibration within the hip-hop community and our community in general. So with this interview, we wanted to contribute a message, a story, and something to think about, regardless if you are a teenager in your 20s, 30s, or 40s. Coming up in this interview, I have a gentleman by the name of Kasasi Hill, also known or formerly known as Little Evil. He received this name as a Pyro gang member and he also served 27 years in prison. And since his release, he has turned his life around and devoted his life towards helping the youth and becoming a youth mentor. What up, though? This your boy, D.O.C., and we have a very special guest on the line. If you would like to, you can go ahead and introduce yourself and tell the people that's tuning in where you're exactly from. Uh, my name is Kisasi Hill. Uh, Kisasi N. Hill. I'm from Pacoima, California, and uh, I'm a youth mentor out of uh, Tia Chuchas in Pacoima for, um, the, tra- uh, for the Trauma to Transformation Program. Cool. Former gang okay. member, the Pacoma Pyru Bloods. Yeah, we definitely going to go down that journey um, to take people from the past up to the beginning to where we're at today, you know, and go through your life story. And, you know, I'm not going to say in brief, but to give people a feel of who you are and what got you to the point to even want to mentor kids and try to send them in a different direction. So, you know, from from your standpoint, growing up in Pacoima, uh, what years would you say was like your teenage or maybe, you know, single digit years? Like what year was that you was growing up in the 70s, going into 80s? Uh, yeah, 70s. I was born there, born and raised there. Actually, you know, I got my family is three generations there. Uh, they arrived there uh, after World War Two, because a lot of my family is from the south. Most of the Pacoima's population is from the south because the city of Pacoima itself was built up as a um military uh uh military or a veterans uh community everybody that was coming out of world war ii was going to los angeles in order to find you know that industrial living because it was this industrial boom in the 40s and uh in the 20s 30s and 40s so my family coming from louisiana on my mom's side and uh alabama on my father's side so you will see a lot of that in Pacoima, a lot of Southern families. This is why even when you go to Pacoima, the city of Pacoima, is, it has a Southern feel. You know, it's a valley. It's Los Angeles, but it's a part of Los Angeles where we wear baseball caps and rode horses. You see what I'm saying? So, right. uh, it, it, yeah, and a lot of farming, a lot of fruit trees and a lot of farming. We lived off the land, you know, because we had a Southern vibe. And because of that, you know, people thought we were a little slow. So that, mm. you know, <laughs> that led to a whole lot of things because, you know, we had gangs and people coming from Los Angeles out there expecting, you know, parts of the valley that was known to be, you know, uh, suburban, like Tarzana and Woodland Hills. You know, those places, uh, uh, UCLA, you know, and all in that area. Uh, Westwood, you get the feel that this is what the valley is. But then when you go north and east of the San Fernando Valley, you'll find the ghetto there. And I use the term ghetto in the real sense of its meaning, the German word prison camp, because that's what it was. It was a prison camp. Whenever you have a society that designates a particular community for a people to stay, that's what they expect you to do, to stay. So... <clears throat> We were, I am a product of that uh, people. So I've always been in Pacoima, uh, from Pacoima Elementary until the time that uh, the Foothill Division, LAPD in Pacoima arrested me. <clears throat> okay, so h- how would you describe your upbringing during that time, like as a kid, elementary, middle school, around that? Was Were there always gangs in Pacoima even at that time, or they migrated afterwards once you got older? Like, how would you describe your actual upbringing, you know, as far as from inside the household with your uh, parents and then, you know, to going outside? That's a good question, because <clears throat> for me, my 
first, you know, even contact with the law because we were living well off. The Valley was well off. A lot of us were working family, working at General Motors and places like that. So before crack hit in the early 80s, which affected a lot of communities, uh, we were living well off. Now, you had your parties in the 70s and, you know, people popping pills or sex and all of that stuff going on. And we had gangs, but the gangs weren't the Bloods and Crips that we know. Back then in the 70s, the Valley had gangs and the gangs were known like the PPA boys, the Pierce Park Apartment boys, where I grew up. And then you had uh, West Side Godfathers, you had East Side Hustlers, you had Clovers, you had, um, you know, various, you had the Pacoima Flats and, uh, and the Pacoima Threses. You know, you had gangs, but it wasn't as prevalent until the early 80s. Once uh, crack cocaine uh, entered into the community, so did migrating gangs from Los Angeles. You know, you had mm -hmm. a lot of different Crip gangs specifically that came out first and actually set up shop was the Front Streets out of Watts. The Front mm -hmm. Street Crips set up in the projects, which was like three, four blocks away from us. And they I re realized that a lot of the guys there that were uh, known as East Side Hustlers and various other gangs, just the projects really, um, begin to represent the Crips begin to wear blue and started cripping. Now, <clears throat> I remember it really, it, uh, the colors and all of that really didn't have an uh, impact on us growing up young because it was more LA. And <clears throat> we saw Crips as a representation of Los Angeles. And we didn't get along with LA at that time. We competed with them in everything from football you know, from Kennedy High School and San Fernando High School playing against Crenshaw, you know, and Carson, et cetera. So there was always this contention, you know, we had with Los Angeles. So when crack came out, now you got people coming from Los Angeles trying to set up shops and set up, uh, you know, places to make money in the valley. Mm -hmm. So that began to become contentious with the people in the back like ice cube had that song uh um a summer man a young man summer vacation mm -hmm. and he talked about going to another state how gang members started taking flights to other states to set up uh shops and then ending up beefing with the with the residents there <laughs> because right. they want their block back well we it started with us they came to the valley first before they went out to uh to another state they went to the neighboring communities around uh surrounding los angeles and we were that that group, what uh, a half hour, twenty five minutes away. So <laughs> that started the contention, where we started fighting and beefing with these guys. Then, so you, so you was already in the mindset or already affiliated. So were you kind of like born into yeah. it? Where you were already viewing yeah. it from that angle? Yeah, I inherited. Okay. You know, I never okay. had to get it put on or anything. Yeah. All of it I inherited. And even from the the uh, creation of the gang that I was from, you know, I, I like to call it tribe. So you're going to hear me say tribe in the place of gang. And I'll get to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But because there is a, you know, there is a tribal uh, uh history to it that 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 often goes that's explained but it don't really go touched on and that's what we were we were a village like living we were an apartment complex before we were a gang mm -hmm. you see we just added a name to who we were already we were the pierce park apartment boys you know we was lived in the pierce park apartment we were a family so closely knitted like any projects or any type of uh, uh, low-income housing, you see the same family, you know, over and over every day. You see their struggles. You see, you know, their parents fight. You see their parents who are on drugs or alcoholics. You know, you know each other's struggle intimately. So when you grow up that way, you know, and you come, you know, you, there, you develop a camaraderie. A camaraderie that's unbreakable. And we were that way as children going to elementary. When we would walk to school, we walked to school as an apartment complex. 
You right. see, and that apartment complex became popular and and known. It was later known as the Vietnams because of the gunplay there. The Vietnams because of the war there, the activity there. You know, and it had a reputation in the valley, even still. You know, to this day, of course, it's not the same as it was, but it has a reputation. Like uh, the Cabrini Greens had a reputation, you know, like the uh, Nickersons or the Jordan Downs, the Jungles. When you hear these names, you know that there's a gang representation that comes with it, you know. So the Noms were one of those as it related to the battle. Now, what we did do is we ended up becoming blood. We became bloods out of defiance against the crips who were spreading because if you know the history of the bloods and crips you know that they were on this 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 campaign on the serious campaign and they outnumbered the bloods at least three to one so um bloods being outnumbered and us identifying with the valley and being against the crips what we did is identify with the blood now, me, I was taught how to be a gang member by the very people who created the gang I claim. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, the very people that started it. In fact, one of the people that started it, I'm named after him. His name was Evil. I'm named Little Evil. But right. I didn't start off as Little Evil. I ended up, you know falling into that name later you know after i ended up earning it because right. I, I, I might say a lot of things about games but i don't like to promote it you know right. because i'm a mentor and i don't want to glamorize it so sometimes i'll choose words to go around description of some things but i know that some things i just got to get it out so right. i want that clear that i don't promote you know gangs or nor do i glamorize the things that i've done but right. in order for you to have a clear understanding of where I'm going, I have to tell you certain things about myself. You know, right. that may seem like, you know, it could be perceived as that. So I want right. to cut the head of that snake off. Um, De definitely. Mo most of the core, the core subscribers here on this channel, and you know, most times videos grow outside of that. But most of the core subscribers here that's been here since day one, they know that that's the perspective uh, I'm, I'm glad that you said that for people just to hear it, period, regardless if it's the core subscribers or beyond to know that that you're not glorifying it. But most of my core subscribers here know that, like, we don't glamorize that life when we do talk about or interview certain people about their stories is to show them it's for a lesson to be learned, you know, right. at, or, or, or to try to detour them from going in that direction, because it's a lot of people that may be sitting in a situation right now where you were prior to going away to jail and they may hear your story and be like, man, maybe that's not the route that they want to go on. So I, I don't want to stop, you know, I didn't mean, you know, pardon me for uh, cutting you off, but I just, so they'll understand when you said when you were taught this by a uh, big evil uh, around what age were you at that time? 12. 12. 12 okay. Because I knew exactly I got out the orphanage. And I was in a North, well, I called it a North, it was called McLaren Hall, which was like a placement home, you know, but I ended up in a foster care. I'm glad you brought that up. I ended up in foster home. So, uh, hitting my boyfriend with a bat and then he took me, chased me out the thing and I jumped over the rail and then it looks, it, you know, he tried to grab me, but it looked like he threw me over the rail. But you say you hit who? My bro, my mom's boyfriend. Okay, your mom's boyfriend. Yeah, I okay, to, that yeah, I tried to hit him with a bat. He actually would have been my very first murder. He would have been my very first murder because uh, he went into my, you know, he used to be abusive to my mom, and he was like, man, this dude was on every type of drug, right? And uh, that life that you live in the projects, and I said that I'm gonna catch this dude when he sleeps. And I'm going to hit him with this bat. But before that, I remember asking one of my older homeboy in the gangs. I was just as when I was just getting allocated towards it. You know, I'm looking at it. I know what it is. I, I see it. I know what it is. I know the difference. And so I asked one of my older homeboys, let me have a gun. 
And he was like, what you want a gun for? And I said, I want a gun because I'm going to shoot my mom's boyfriend. And he said, no, I'm not going to be a gun man, to go shoot your mom's boyfriend. You know, we're not, don't, don't do that. You know, he tried to talk me down. I said, don't do that. <laughs> so I went back and I ended up hitting him with a baseball bat instead. But I didn't get him good enough because I was too young, didn't have enough behind it, I guess. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, that got me into the foster home because when the police came, you know, they came into the house, they looked around, and they said it was, uh, they, the dude was on drugs, heroin was found into the, in the house. So they said, hey, you know, got to send this dude, got to send the kid to protect the child protective service. So I wasn't your average kid. You know, living in that type of environment, I was always a little ahead to the point where my grandmother used to tell people, you know, that boy has been here before. You know, people used to say I had a look in my eyes that, you know, wasn't the look of a child. I had a knowing and there was a knowing there. So they ended up taking me to the foster care and I ran from the foster home, caught the bus back home. <laughs> they took me from Pacoima to Carson. Once I found out I was in Carson, I jumped on a bus and took a bus, you know, uh, with no money, told the bus driver that some kids was chasing me from school. And I, uh, they got my, my bus pass. Back then we had bus passes and transfers. So he gave me a transfer and I got home. But when I got home, the police and child protective service was waiting for us. So now my whole apartment complex see me get arrested. <laughs> I get handcuffed and taken off. So they think I'm in jail, but they instead they send me to a more confined environment, which was McLaren Hall, because the foster care and the people they child protective services people didn't want to run run the risk of me running again and getting in trouble, having heads flying. Fly. So I stayed there for like six months until they figured out where I was supposed to go. And uh, by the time my mom got me back in custody, now I was a gang member. When I came back, you know, oh, in McLaren Hall, I remember, you know, when you get in there, there's some guys in there, you know, little kids stuff, man. They try to bully you, take your, your cookies and stuff like that, you know. And I remember fighting, and my response was, uh, PPA boys. And that was the first time I ever remember ever saying I was from PPA boys, which mm. was the Pierce Park apartment. You know, I knew I lived there. I was born there, but I had never consciously identified as being from there, you know, until I ended up in McLaren Hall in this confined environment with kids from other places. So when I got back, out of McLaren Hall, now I'm like, yeah, I'm PPA boy. I feel like I'm bred it in. I didn't went to a placement and, you know, screamed out PPA boy. So I guess that made me valid, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I come back uh, and I'm claiming PPA, but I realized that a lot of the older guys that I looked up to, you know, Dale Lloyd and Eric Griffin, you know, Ernie Townsend, Robert Townsend, uh, boom certain people that was in my neighborhood that were you know re uh, uh, people I looked up to in sports and fights and whatever it was were all wearing red so I'm you know I thought that was for kid why is everybody in red and you know they're celebrating me coming home you know and I'm noticing that everybody wearing red now I have to go my mom's gonna give me some more clothes cause I didn't, outgrew my other clothes so now I want red and I'm wearing the red. Now, once we get in there, I'm finding out. I get back to school, uh, McClay Junior High. And I remember a lot of the kids that I grew up with and played football with are now, you know, in the projects, they're wearing blue. These are people that my mom went to clubs with. Their children, you know, are wearing blue and they lango is cuz. You know, so I'm thinking, oh, you guys are acting like L.A. Not realizing by us wearing the red, we were doing the exact same thing, you know, but 
to me, right. it was like, you know, hey, you guys are acting like L.A. Why are you guys wearing blue and, you know, being Crips? But that's what they were. They were being Crips. And we ended up being Bloods. But we ended up taking the name PPA. I didn't. They did. I wasn't, you know, even there to do that. But uh, from what I was told, Del Lloyd. Uh, Diesel is the one who actually called us by name. Uh, B Crazy was the one who had the bright idea to associate with the Bloods because he had just gotten out of jail. Uh, him and B Capone. And they were always beefing with the Crips in there. And then the OVGs, the original Valley Gangsters, didn't get along with Los Angeles either. So we were following also in these guys' footsteps who were our uncles and our fathers. So um, he ends up saying, we, uh, evil, though. Evil was the one that pushed it the hardest, you know. But, and I'm not just saying that for namesake. I'm saying that because it literally happened. Because a lot of other guys went to jail. And when he went to jail, when the war started with guns on the streets, we relied on him to get us through, you know, and teach us through that because we were children, man, literally at war like that, like uh, that award winning book, uh, Beast of No Nation, where mm -hmm. in Africa they had children, you know, on the front line of guerrilla wars. And we forget that we were toting automatic weapons, having shootouts up close, man, in liquor stores. You know, I had a shootout in the liquor store <laughs> and I always say I was shooting through chips. Now, when you look at this and it sounds like some stuff through movies because they portray these things in the movies. But you got to realize I was a 13 year old kid and this stuff happened for real, for real. Life is much too real to pretend anything. Just real quick. I just wanted to ask you, you named a few, um, a nice amount of names of different people from the apartments or people that were, um, I guess, the developers or you know, the leaders of the PPA or the Bloods and Pacoima. And you said, you know, it started out of defiance kind of towards L.A. and then the Crips that was there. And not we're not going to stick on that, but I just want to ask, at this point, at 12, 13 years old, had you already met or ran across WAC 100 at this particular time or this was later on in no, life? man, WAC 100 is literally like six years younger than me, man. So when I was doing this, if I was 12, he was six. You see okay. what I'm saying? Okay. I, was, okay. I went to prison three days after my 16th birthday for murder. Okay. He was 10. You okay, so, so, it's, so, so it's a difference of age. It's a difference of age. It's a difference of generation. It's a difference of reality. You so know, because when he was out doing whatever it is that he was doing, and I, I don't have a clue as to what he was doing, I was in prison living out my own reality. Right. Because that was another that was another story. You know, going through gangs in the streets, you know, shootouts, fights, fist fights, all of that was one thing. That was one chapter. But once you got to prison, you got to think, I went to prison in 87. In the 80s. So, we talking about Fee from 60s and all of these well-known people that was on Time Magazine, you know, uh, and gangs, you know, because that's when gangs, Bloods and Crips really got known in Los Angeles is when Fee and them shot up that house, you know, in the early 80s. And it was all over the news. And they put they proposed this war on gangs, you know, Reagan and Dukakis and all of this stuff. They built all these prisons and then they, you know, legislated all these laws and they filled them up with us. Right. So we were the ones that was, you know, the lifers that was getting, I mean, man, we was getting life back to back. We had in the county jail, you had modules where gangs were divided and separated from the rest of the general population. These modules were full of people, full of gang members serving, I mean, or uh, receiving life sentences for murder. We're talking about dudes, man, that was never getting out. And you had us all in one small environment. Can you imagine the insanity? So, nah, that dude wasn't even around when this stuff was going on. When we had to fight our way through the blood module. We had 4300 as a module only for bloods. It was all bloods, you know. And you Can couldn't you? just come in that module. 
saying that you was a blood. You better know somebody that know somebody that know somebody, man. And if you still know somebody, you better know something about something. And you went in at, in 87. And when did you come out? I, I went in at 87 and I got out in 2013. Okay. And, and in total, you know, that how much time did you do? 27 years. 27 years okay now I, now there's a question i want to ask you because it may be uh well i'm not gonna say maybe there are parents not only teenagers people in their 20s 30s parents listening um to just step back a little bit and then come back to where we at now do you feel in hindsight you know around that age of 12 11 10 9 when you were in the house and you were seeing abuse or seeing these different things, in hindsight, do you feel like it built up some form of anger in you that made you try to resonate more with the streets or you were already mentally on that path? I'm going to tell you the really, sh- I almost cuss, I'll tell you the realest thing I-, I can speak. Gangs was not a bad influence on me. I already had a rage in me. You know, that was built up because of my life experiences before that, where gangs itself became the perfect vehicle for me to express the rage I already had. You see, I was I was angry because my mom and dad was on drugs. I was angry, you know, because I had to go to a foster home and to have that separation, you know, that that feeling of powerless powerlessness. You know, to have, you, when you look up to your dad and you think he's the ultimate power and you find out that he can be slammed on his face, handcuffed and you can be separated. You know, you start to lose faith in the very things that you thought was comfortable. You know, that was your haven. So you I started looking for that out there in the streets. And then once I got out in the streets, I realized that ain't nobody there to protect you. You have to do that on your own. All of that. So. That rage that I already had to make me what they call a a successful gang member, because a successful gang member is somebody that ended up with a life sentence or dead. That's a successful gang member. If you ain't end up with a life sentence and dead, you ain't been successful. At what it is that you was doing. Right. You know, so that level of success, you know, let's not get that. clear. I ain't never seen a successful gang member. You know, I saw a semblance of, of one, a fantasy of one. When you see somebody like Suge Knight sitting up and you like, whoa, look, a successful gang member. But then you end up seeing where he at right now. Right. And you find out that that, you know, there's no success in it. So, no, man, I ain't never witnessed a successful gang member. If you are a gang member and you up there at the top like that, the police see you. People see you. So that means either you are compromising what it is that you're professing to be successful at, or you know you you ain't doing as good as you say you do. You know what right. I'm saying? You're not you're not as successful as you say, and that's what we find in the entertainment industry: people perpetuating this gang violence or this gang personification, but they really not that because them real gang members are sitting up there at them life senses right now. That's trying to get up out of there right now. They still in there. You know, we like to read books about bloods and crips in Los Angeles and stuff like that. These brothers are still in there. They still alive. With the exception of Tookie. Right. You understand? So, um, if you want to know, like I said, anything about this, that man, that's where it's at. That's where the story at. All of these other people telling stories and they weren't even there. You got people representing things, you know, that they don't even care about how it started. How can you, you know, how can you profess to rep something and love something and hate the roots of it at the same time? Hmm. Or despise or disrespect the roots of it at the same time. And that goes all the way. I mean, that, that, that hand, that philosophy goes deep because, you know, a lot of people know that the Bloods and Crips, we came out of the Black Panther Party. Right. You know, um, a brother did a, um, Clee did a nice documentary called Bastards of the Party. And he expressed that. You know, Clee from Anthony. Right. If right. I don't know what you're familiar with. But 
he did a, a nice documentary, you know, uh, and it was called Bastards of the Party. And what he was talking about, Bastards of the Black, Black Panther Party. Because of that connection with Bunchy Carter, who was a Slauson. You see what I'm saying? So when you go and who was assassinated also on UCLA campus. So let's not forget that either. You know, so um, once that happened and then they started arresting people like Geronimo Pratt and all of them, we were left with Tookie and them. We were left with Bartender and Putin to, you know, to lead us in whatever it is that we ended up doing as children. Because we forget that these gang members that we're talking about, Tookie, Putin, Raymond Washington, these were juveniles. Uh-huh. We like to look at them in their adulthood and paint them as monsters, but we forget that these were juvenile delinquents. 